दीप जले और जागा ये मन दीप जले और जागा ये मन मोरा जो बनाना वेलरा इन द बिगिनिंग इट वाज the word for an educated woman was agali which was called harafa purush jab istri ke bare mein likhta hai to anuman se likhta hai istri jab istri ke bare mein likhti hai to anubhav se likhti hai ye anubhav aur anuman ka farq hamesha rahega it has meant uh, deep consolation knowing that someone has been here before just knowing that this particular experience or psychological or cultural condition that i'm experiencing now has happened before uh, whereas you know there was any number of histories of the left movement peasant movement such like nobody had thought of the women's movement I was working in publishing at the time and I tried to talk to my bosses who were all very nice people ask them if they why we don't do books by women and they didn't even think that there was anything there to write about for a man um his wife is someone who is not going to leave very easily especially if she doesn't wander off into jungle parks or read the wrong literature if you don't understand how women have lived and how they reflect upon their lives how will it make policies for women how will it understand what we need in the contemporary society kitab hijra na dara main ja na le hu kahe lagaye jatiya ha 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 mera jo bana na velara my mura jo bana na velara ma the first mention of uh, women per se in any capacity to be uh, regarded as literate appears in the rigved when they mention there are 10 verses dedicated to a lady called maitri who is the wife of a, of the sage yagnavalka and there is also gargi who is who is celebrated as a very well established philosopher the first women's anthology is actually attributed to the to buddhist monks in between this late 6th century early 7th century and by the time buddha makes his appearance in 623 you've had a lot of women who come into the fold of the buddha sanghas because they offered freedom one of the early texts that we have is the verses composed by bikku monks and and by bikkuni uh, nuns and they are called thera thera gatha and theri gatha uh, they are, they are modeled on the similar pattern that is the men's verses are codified under thera gatha and the women's voices are codified under this text called theri gatha now if you make a comparison you will actually see that the things that men talk about are very different from the things that women talk about in their verses so uh, what women seem to talk about is quite a lot based on experiences and e- experiences of all kinds including this search for uh, the higher self there's this very interesting account in which the tempter mara comes to a woman who's seated under a tree and is uh, a bhikkhuni who's seated under a tree and she's she's meditating and this guy says to her what are you doing sitting under this tree and meditating all you need is two finger consciousness and what is two finger consciousness it's the ability to put your hand in a pot of rice that is cooking take out the rice and test whether it's cooked or not so it's called two finger <laughs> it's been translated as two finger consciousness and she responds back saying what do i want to do with two finger consciousness i seek okasha space uh, the the sky is that you know what you might describe as the extended self
हाय रे हाय रे हाय भूति भला कति कान छुटी हाय रे हाय रे हाय भूति भला कति कान छुटी हाय रे हाय रे हाय भूति भला कति कान द फर्स्ट वर्क्स दैट कम आउट अदर देन द द नन्स ऑफ कोर्स are the usual women it's there's no difference in how women talk and behave so the first uh, works that come out are women dissing their husbands talking about uh, their mothers in law and how terrible they are and how badly treated they are household drudgery how much they have to walk for water how much they have to cook and sexual slavery and this entire um, angst that they have actually repressed and held within them for many centuries women sang these songs while they cut paddy as they do in tamil nadu even today it's also how they uh, how they wrote in a way because they created those verses as they worked mehuri ni uri danda tuti re bhuti bhala kati kan chuti mehuri ni uri danda ved हा करे पुराणे गर्जती स्त्रीये संगती हित नो सहज स्त्रीयेचाची देह परमार्थाची सोय आता कैची एंड सो दिस दिस ब्युटिफुल ब्युटिफुल स्टोरी बाय बहिणा भाय हु लिव्ह इन दी mid 1600s i guess and it's a story about a young woman a young girl really she's just 11 when the story begins and she has somehow some higher power within her and this higher power manifests itself in the way she communicates with the family cow and car because they only respond to her and so she becomes a bit of a phenomenon and travels through um the region Uh, to visit various holy people and her husband she's 11 but she's married becomes acutely jealous of this response and so he beats her brutally and nobody can stop him and her uh, family looks on various other people look on and it's all told in this beautiful verse it's an abhang really my duty is to serve my husband for he is god to me my husband himself is the supreme brahma and it's so deeply tragic you know when you read the whole poem it's so deeply tragic that she should come to this and you want to cry out to her across the centuries to say no no don't do it you know find your own path but of course that's the poem bhakti again is an expression of freedom of seeking one's own personal idea of god it actually broke the caste barriers that you didn't need to have a purohit you didn't have to have a brahman i didn't have to pay him money the bhakti movement saw a lot of women because uh, being in the house i could seek there were there was freedom to seek divinity i think there is definitely a difference between the women poets you know the mystic poets and the men this i have certainly you pick it up each of them are quite individual obviously the timbers are very different but there is definitely a difference and to my mind it's for instance just the abandon of meera you know i don't think any other poet comes close to that you know that kind of ecstatic abandon or um, the capacity for despair you know so despair and union those extremes the kind of voltage of meera no one comes close to hare piv ki
Across India, she's very well known. Without knowing it, we often have her language on our tongue. Even today, you will find verses in Rajasthan which say, which tell you very clearly that uh, she's a disgrace, a stain upon the community. You think of her, she's someone who from a very early age knew her mind. She was forced to get married, it would appear. This is the story that we, we are all told. And there are other kinds of myths that, are, that, that float around. But once she decides in her mind, I'm talking about this mythological one, Meera, then she is completely focused on Sri Krishna, the love of her life. So when you mention the word determined, how else can you justify what she is doing, excepting that she is one hell of a determined woman? And the saddest part is that we have forgotten that she is a rebel. Mudhuparani is 18th century, 1760s. It's again an interesting era. It's, uh, it's almost the end game as far as uh, the Indian kingdoms, the British had already arrived, the French had already arrived, the Portuguese had arrived. There is a lot of very interesting um, interplays between all these foreign powers and how they came to rule India and their interactions with local the kingdoms and their societies and how they impacted um, the way of life. Raja Raja Shola actually donates 400 Devdasis to the temple. These were celebrated women. They had a right to property. They had they owned their own money. They had multiple suitors with impunity. It didn't really matter and nobody, it was not uh, questioned. It was not like as if she was dedicated to one man and had to be, uh, there was no monogamy as far as, there was no restrictions. It was not, you're not a wife. Mudhuparani spoke Tamil, wrote in Tamil, in Kannada, in Telugu, in Sanskrit. Radhika Santavanam is also probably arising from her own personal angst. The grandmother was also a courtesan of the king, also belonged with the king, yeah. Pratap Singh. Mudupayani also becomes part of his concubine, part of his, and she becomes his favoured courtesan. After a while, the king turns his attentions back to the grandmother, to the older, to the older woman. So this whole trauma that she goes through of, uh, of love and longing for, for her lover, she translates into a book called Radhika Santavanam. There was this complete churning of society which was looking at, um, which was supporting the British. They thought courtesans were a bad influence on society, the Devdasis were corrupting youth. What was a celebrated work in the 17th century becomes a book to be banned in the 20th century. In the beginning, the word for an educated woman was a gali, which was called harrafa. That, who knows harf, that means who knows the letters. And it was used for the wives and so on, you know. We had this very funny form in Urdu called rehti, which is men pretending to be women and writing, you know, about women fighting with each other and uh, women complaining about their lovers. But the women, except for a few uh, tawaifs, courtesans who wrote and um, Goharjan, her mother was a poet, but she had a male takhallus. One is you grow aware of just how many ways there are of rendering certain presences invisible, right? So you're completely obliterated, rendered voiceless, smudged out of history. This was something that I became acutely aware of when I was uh, a student, you know, that these voices needed to be reclaimed. Equally, I grew aware of just how easy it was for me to be rendered voiceless. That was perhaps my greatest terror as a 16-year-old, not having a voice. One is to find your voice, the other is to be heard. It used to rain pearls. The fresh waters used to gush through the fields. The fields watered thus would rustle with chamba grain. Of all this wealth of fields and grain, I was the mistress. Then my lord, 
was taken away from me a short while ago. And now, for a fistful of rice, I am famine stricken. The 19th century sort of um, privileged the women's question over every other question. Among the most powerful stories is the account of little girls uh, who have to observe the Ekadashi fast. And the Ekadashi fast comes every uh, two weeks, I think. And um, then they're not even allowed to drink water. And in the hot circumstances of, uh, of uh, uh, South Asia, uh, there are stories of the little girls licking the earth because that would be moist. Now, I mean, that's the kind of uh, regime that uh, they were being subjected to. So in some way, I think the 19th century man uh, began to feel the oppressiveness of that system because there were widows in everybody's family. I have seen my house. My mother was 22 years old in the village. She was the king of the English. My mother said to her sister, कि दादाजी मैं पढ़ना चाहती हूँ गांव से स्कूल था कई कोर्स दूर और वहाँ जाऊँगी पढ़ने तो मेरे बाबा ने तो मना नहीं किया बल्कि उनका मजाक उड़ाया गया पूरे समाज में बाबा का कि इनकी बहू पढ़ने जाती है माताजी को कहा गया है पागल औरत पढ़ने जाती है फर्स्ट सीरियस अकाउंट इज एक्चुअली पंडिता � polemic on Sri Purush Tulna, in which actually the widow is the trigger for her writing. So actually, the print revolution gives women the capacity to enter the public sphere on their own terms. You, you push yourself into the public sphere in, at a moment when the public sphere is not actually willing to include you. So there's this big debate around uh, the age of marriage and the age of consent being raised. And there's Dayaram Gidumal in Western India who sends out a questionnaire to everybody. He doesn't send a single questionnaire to a woman. It's the reform is about women. No woman uh, is allowed to enter the debate. So it's quite extraordinary. So at that time, people write letters to the newspaper. That's one way they get into the public sphere. From the 30s onwards, there are literary movements and women are very much a part of it. So there's Rashid Jahan, for instance. There's um, Kurutul Haider, there's uh, Ismat Chuktai. So for a long time, women wrote in the male voice. Earlier, when men wrote about women, it was, you know, showing their weakness and they're all very, uh, how they have to be looked after and rescued and so on. You know, all the fairy stories are about that. But when people like uh, uh, Rashid Jahan all started writing, then they were very combative women and who stood up and said what's what and so on. People like Isma Chuktai and all were writing in a few, and people held that against her in the beginning, that she was only writing about the world of women. And they thought it was not a big enough project for her to be considered a major writer. Kratulin Heder, as you know, is a very is a cult figure in Urdu literature. Of course, with her Aag Kadarya, she became an international figure. She talks about singers of Lucknow. She talks about art. She talks about temples. She talks about mosques. She talks about dancing girls. If you've read Aag Kadarya, it talks, there are, there are characters in Aag Kadarya belong to the Hindu tradition, the old Hindu tradition, the old Buddhist tradition, Islam and Christianity. In a way, they represented the Indian culture. The book culminates, this novel culminates at partition. And this pain which the writer has been living, this nausea, is, comes through this Agkadarya. Aj akha var sijaru ki to kabra vichcho bol aj kitab e ishq da koi agla var ka bol akha var sijaru ki to kabra vichcho bol aj kitab e ishq da koi agla var ka bol I mean it's now clear that the rape and abduction of women happened on a mass scale. 
We know from statistics of different organizations that at least 100,000 women were abducted, possibly raped, impregnated by men of the other religion, uh, sometimes raped by men of their own religion because they don't magically become better at, at moments like this. And many were killed by their own families in order to ostensibly save them from possible rape. Uh, these histories were not talked about much, uh, partly because I think for the men of the different communities, the rape of their women within courts is seen as a kind of failure on their part to protect their women. Then this is really the dark side of independence. Violence was not the only thing that happened to women at partition. You know, there were so many ways in which their lives changed. In fact, one of the women I talked to even said, you know, it was a moment when I spread my wings. Immediately after uh, independence, I mean, we grew up in those decades after uh, independence. The main advice to women was uh, um, to really be good mothers and good women citizens. And one of the ways of being good uh, women citizens was to take care of the house. And many of us protested against that. We felt now that the women have come out, why should they go back <laughs> into the house? There's this beautiful story by Ambai uh, from this wonderful book with the wonderful title called Fish in a Dwindling Lake. Um, and the story is called The Calf That Frolicked in the Hall. The older man, for his part, had no doubt at all that literature, music, painting and dance were all strongly linked to impropriety. Now, Kada's father was not in the least concerned about her impropriety or lack of it, but the argument, the boy will be ruined, struck him forcibly. Under what circumstances does a woman start writing? Like, uh, some time back, I was uh, abroad and somebody on the stage asked me that a male writer had come from India some time back and they had asked him, how do stories come to you? And he said that I wake up every morning and I open the window and stories come flying to me like birds, you know. So they asked me, um, what do you think about it? I told them it's a wonderful metaphor to say that uh, stories come like birds flying. I said, but the thing is that one should have a window to open. That's one thing. Another thing is that the family must allow the women to stand by the window, open it and wait for these stories to come. क्या होता है गांव में कि जिस घर में पुरुष नहीं होता उसकी जमीन को हड़पने को आ जाते हैं बहुत लोग स्त्री होती है खाली तो उससे कहते हैं कि तुझसे हम शादी कर लेंगे और वो जान जाते हैं जब ये आ जाएगी तो जमीन साथ आएगी और स्त्री जो है शादी की इतनी वो होती है बेचारी को इतना परेशान कर दिया जाता है बिना शादी शुदा स्त्री जो होती है विधवा हो जाए या अपरसिकता हो उसके लिए मुश्किल हो जाती है तो वो सब पूरी कहानी मैंने इधर नमम करके इधर नमम मीन्स कि ये मेरा नहीं है ये मेरे लिए नहीं है है ना इधर नमम से भी पहले मैं कबूतराओं पर लिखना चाहती थी वहाँ कबूतरियाँ जो हैं उन पर क्या उनके पास कोई खेती नहीं है कबूतराओं के पास कोई नौकरी नहीं देता उन्हें 
کوئی جو مزدوری ہے وہ نہیں کہ نہیں تم چور ہو کیونکہ ڈینوڈ کی فائٹ جاتیاں کہا گیا ہے بھی مکت جاتیاں وہ کاغذ میں ہیں صرف بیوہر میں نہیں ہیں کبوترے تو زیادہ تر جنگل میں رہیں گے جیل میں اور کبوتریاں جو ہیں عام راستہ چل نہیں سکتی کسان کے کھیت میں میڑ سے بھی نکلیں جن کسانوں کی رحم میں میں مری جاتی ہوں وہی کسان اگر کبوتری نکل رہی ہے کبوترا کی پتنی بیٹی بہن جو بھی نکل رہی ہے اس سے تو بھی اس سے سیکس کی ڈیمانڈ کی جائے گی When I was in college, we read Dopti by Mahashweta Devi. It was also when I read Sultana's Dream. You know, I, I found Sultana's Dream charming. It was charming because I think wit and humor have mattered to women so much. And the ability to turn, turn the table, to be able to look at it the other way. Um, why not tame men, you know? Um, The, the lion is tamed by the lion tamer. I mean, there's no question of strength being a rationale for why women should stay home, and, and nor is it a rationale for why men should not stay home. So, uh, you know, I, I was charmed by it, but what really um, affected me in the sense of, like, um, sea change or r radical uprooting kind of change, rethinking, putting down new roots and, and forming new ideas, was when I read um, De uh, Mashweta Devi's work. This particular work, because I think Devi's identification of the character Dopti, both historically in the Draupadi story and in the contemporary story of tribal women and their plight, and the way in which all women are, ex uh, are, are um, um, have to live with the fear of of assault, of, of uh, having their autonomy um, taken from them. She is writing from the dailiness of whatever she stands for. And yet it's not a kind of didactic, message-bearing, uh, uh, position-taking, position-taking in the sense that, yes, her writing does posit itself as a kind of um, resistance. It is. I mean, uh, a literature of resistance, if you want to label it. She uses the phrase, body pele debo, you know, like, I shall throw my body into the fray. And she says it casually, but she means it, and she has done this. I think there was um, uh, both a story and a real life situation where in the real life, the protagonist actually was beaten to death, but no marks on his body because the police had supposedly wrapped him in a blanket. Uh, and the family managed to, especially the wife, managed to actually, quote unquote, steal the body. And uh, the police had no clue. They were desperately trying to find uh, the body. Well, this woman protected the body for some three, four weeks uh, till she was ready to file the case. Um, she actually made a bed, and, and the body was beneath the bed, you know, on a sort of wooden platform. And, so symbolically, it's uh, very dramatic, theatrical, all kinds of imagery comes into mind visually and otherwise. Uh, the idea of her sleeping on her husband's corpse, in a sense, concealing it, um, saving it as the only proof to produce before a court to say this is what actually happened. So in that sense, and this is, you know, and uh, again, I don't remember the story, but it appears exactly like that in a story that she wrote. Up until the time that we uh, were studying Kamala Das, I had only been exposed to, you know, writers like Sarojini Naidu's poems, or like the Bangle Sellers, and which was all very pretty and sweet and very uh, nice. But then uh, I encountered Kamala Das, and here was an, a writer who was, you know, talking about things that actually shocked me, like the female anatomy and uh, feelings that were so strong that they couldn't be contained. I felt like I could have been reading someone's diary, you know, it was, it was so personal, it was so 
intimate it also gives you a kind of respect for the person standing up and saying that okay i have these feelings i have this body i have this these emotions i want to express myself and um, it allows you to respect that person and by way of doing that you kind of give, respect your own emotions your own uh, your own body your own uh, experiences So this is, a, as you know, um, the book about the life of a domestic worker. Poor baby, what else could one say of her? Imagine a childhood so brief, so ephemeral, that you could sit down and the whole thing could unravel in front of you in barely half an hour. And yet, her childhood fascinates baby. Perhaps everyone is fascinated by the things they've been deprived of, the things they long for. Baby remembers her childhood. She savors every moment of it. She licks it just as a cow would her newborn calf, tasting every part. I, to me, this is the most beautiful passage in this book. It's a passage where this young woman who does not know how to write turns into a writer. If you look at women's writing, let's say over the last um, 40 years, perhaps longer, the sorts of things they're writing about and the sorts of women who are writing. Dalit women are writing now. You see women like uh, women who are not writers, but who feel they have something to say, like Baby Haldar, the domestic worker, like Salma, the panchayat leader, like Shanti, the driver who's learning how to drive a taxi, you know, or like uh, Revati, the hijra, the transgender person who's writing about her life. Now, all of these kinds of writings would not have entered the canon of literature earlier. Blue Donkey series, the fables of Blue Donkey. Now, you obviously don't relate to a, a donkey and one that's blue necessarily, but the emotions that the Blue Donkey is going through, where she is just is uh, being herself, and uh, you have all the villagers trying to say that no, she should be grey, and she she's clashing with the red bridge and with her pink carrots and all of the things that the way she should be. And then you can relate to that, you know, the way your, your grandmother says that Acha, chote baal achhe nahi lagte, ko lambe baal chahiye. And uh, your dad tells you that your, your jeans are too skinny or your mom tells you that your kurtas are too short or sleeveless. Or, everybody's trying to put you in some kind of mold or the other. Maya Kamath, the uh, only woman political cartoonist passed away. We contacted her family and we wanted uh, her cartoons. So they have given us um, 8,000 cartoons of Maya Kamat. Then we also brought out a book on uh, cartoons, 1,000 cartoons called The World of Maya. Drag, two men dragging women away by their hair, you know, like they came in and say, uh, thank goodness we have progress from the Neolithic period. Cave flows must have been very bumpy, the woman says, you know. That. I mean, men are still doing it. <laughs> Small things like that. Dalit woman from Kutch. Oh. And she uh, has for years been drawing the women's movement. This is her self-portrait. She's called Radha Ben Garve. Here they are going off to the collector complaining and asking protesting. him. For, yeah, protesting. Yeah, protesting patriarchy. So here she goes to her first uh, international conference. She has to go out of the village. She gets an auto and the driver is driving like a maniac. So she's clutching on to the top thing, you know. And then she reaches there and she's in a plane. Oh. And that's a plane. So she gets to the place and then she goes up in a lift. Because <laughs> we did a book which every feminist publisher dreams about. We had this opportunity with a book called Sharir Ki Jankari in Hindi which came to us uh, through a group of uh, village women from Rajasthan. They had a condition they imposed on us. They said, look, 75 of us have written this book. 75. 75, 75 village women. And they said, we don't believe in individual authorship. It's a collectively written book. So you must carry all 75 names on the cover. This was a challenge for us, you know. So we did this. This is the back of the book. And there are all these 75 names over here. So these are all the authors of the book. And they showed us this book, which traced the female body from the girl's birth to old age, through adolescence, through marriage, and which looked at menstruation, sex, childbirth, the whole thing. 
people laughed at them. They said, this is not a realistic book. You never see a naked woman in a village and you've made the naked body. So then they went back with this thing, how to project the naked body without showing the naked body. But this is the solution they came up with. Here you see a woman, she's fully dressed, head to toe, like in the gown. Then you lift it up and you see how she's made from underneath. So completely decorous. And it's not only the woman, but it's also the man who gets the same treatment. Because you don't see Nanga Admi in the village. So you see this man, he's in his dhoti, chhati is bare. Then you see, the, lift up the dhoti. Then you make another little lifting up and you see here. Yeah, and then you see this. And this is, this. you know, all these little sperm, they've got ribbons for girls and no ribbons for boys. So <laughs> it is beautifully done. So this is another book that we did, which to me is perhaps the most important book we did. I see a lot of stories here and many of my stories from the first collection um, that I put out um, are in this park and the park is referenced and that there's a story with the Pujari and his daughter and that's from this park. People in the colony are aware so periodically I'm taken aside and I'm told nay mat karo ye nahi karna chahiye this will happen to you that will happen to you and you know no one will say what will happen to me. Um, it would be impolite for me to say to the man who's saying don't walk in the park, it would be impolite for me to say why not, what will happen to me. I think the extension of the answer that he would have to give is that, you know, he or his ilk would be willing to stop me. I mean, this nice polite invitation to not walk in the park can be extended all the way out to its inevitable conclusion that I will be prevented from walking and that there will be violence involved in the prevention. सम्मान हम स्त्री को सम्मान देते हैं अब ये भी नारा देखती होगी ये भी गलत है सम्मान नहीं हमें समानता चाहिए सम्मान तो तुम एक दिन दे दोगे सम्मान क्या रोज रोज दिया जाता है किसी को सम्मानित करते हैं तो एक ही दिन भैया लोग शाल ले जाओ फूल ले जाओ पैसे ले जाओ हैं रोज रोज तो देते हैं लेकिन समानता आपको रोज देनी पड़ेगी बहुत महंगी है जिसकी आदत नहीं आपको The city and I. This time, we didn't circle each other. The city and I. Hackles raised, fur bristling. This time, there was space between us and we weren't competing. Space enough and more for the nose digging librarian and her stainless steel tiffin box. For the little theater, Pion to read me endless Marathi poems on rainy afternoons. My relationship with the city has been a very, uh, a very good one, I think. I mean, the flip side of that is that I absolutely despair, despair of it. And that despair comes from the class, uh, dif the, the class hierarchies. When I started cycling, I used to do this thing of um, counting the number of cycles that I saw on the road on my very small commute to my office and back and to my other office and back. Now, on, on either, any one of those legs of cycling, it was maximum 20, 25 minutes of, being, of actually cycling down the roads. And I saw an average, average, because I used to count them every day, of between 60 and 70 cyclists. Over the course of a year, I counted two other women, apart from me. For the woman on the 710 Bhayandar Slow, with green combs in her hair, to say and say again, he's coming to get me, he's coming. This time, the city surged towards me, mangy, bruised-eyed, non-vaccinated, suddenly mine. Now, 
you know, nine, ten years later, I do a similar kind of cycle and I see women or girls on cycles once a day, possibly even twice a day. So I think, I have no sociological data to back this up, but I think there may be a little mini revolution of women getting onto bikes. This mobile phone is going to be so much. And mobile phone is going to be so much. And they are talking about it. So I said, where did this phone come from? My husband has given it to him. He has given it to him. No, they will give it to him, they will never give it to him. Where did they give it to him? That we are giving it to him from our mother. We have said that, Dad, you don't give us a shirt, you don't give us a mobile. Right? So, this is the same thing in his mind. He has given it to his wife. Now, he doesn't stop. Now, it's not the same thing. Now, it's not the same thing. So when I think of what literature does for women, I think what it does, it's not that it has sort of a, 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 a policy or a position which tells women to go out and loiter. It actually is an act of loitering. Women across the board are wanting to give expression to what they're thinking, what they're feeling. And that is a change that as a publisher, a feminist, an activist, I see and am very, very heartened by. Reading and writing are about questioning the status quo. When we break something, people get difficult. And we want to get out of it. But we don't get out of it. This is our power.